Thank you for tuning in to Talking Bay 94, the Star Wars podcast devoted to interviews with the cast, crew, and creators of a galaxy far, far away. I'm your host, Brandon Winerdy, and today I'm talking to Silas Carson, who played five different characters across all of the Star Wars prequels, especially known, though, for his iconic portrayals of Jedi Master Kaidi Mundi and Trade Federation leader Newt Gunray. Listen closely to when he starts doing voices of these characters and figure out if you can hear me have a minor freak out. But in any case, this is Talking Bay 94, Episode 75, The Great Silas Carson. Mr. Carson, again, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking. It really is a huge honor. And I, even before Star Wars, I'd love to just dive in first with what like initially inspired you, what made you want to become an actor in the first place? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a funny question, because uh, I think a lot of people who are actors, um, you know, say, oh, I wanted to be an actor when I was a kid, or, you know, I started acting when I was a child, or, you know, it was always in my head to do this. And that wasn't the case for me at all. It was not on my radar at all. I hadn't even thought about this kind of thing. And um, in the 70s, I was at a public school in England. um, And in the sixth form, they always used to do a school musical every summer and, uh, and a play in the winter. And that would mean that you had to rehearse for two hours on a Thursday afternoon. And I, my lesson at the time was double history and I wasn't enjoying it. So I decided I was going <laughs> to like audition. This is absolutely true. I was just going to audition so that I could like, you know, get off that double lesson. Um, and so I auditioned for a, just a small part in the chorus mm-hmm. of Guys and Dolls. And, uh, and when they put up the, the list, I saw that I had, uh, they'd given me the part of Sky Masterson, who's, you know, <laughs> Yeah, who's, who's the lead? <laughs> the only role I, I share with Marlon Brando, I'm very happy. That's great. So I went on stage at the age of uh, 16, 17, and you know, for the, I just was like, "Wow, I love this!" Yeah, I absolutely love this. And from there on in, I was determined to go to drama school, mm-hmm. uh, and I just completely changed direction from where I was heading. I did a lot of plays at school in the last kind of, you know, four terms that I was there. Set up my own little theater company when I left and then ended up going to drama school. But the funny thing is that my mum said to me years later, not very long ago, actually, she said that when I was four years old, apparently I was showing off in front of the family. And, uh, and when I kind of, I was like, I used to do silly voices and impersonations and stuff. And then when I went off out of the room, my dad turned to my mum and said, he's going to be an actor. And my mum said, really? What makes you think that? And he just went, I just know. I just That's know. crazy. But they never told me that story till years later. You know, my dad, <laughs> you know, I knew you were going to be an actor. He didn't just... So it kind of it just fell upon me, really. Mm-hmm. And then it just became a passion. And I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, incredible. And I mean, I'd love to dive further into, you know, your training at the Drama Center, Royal Shakespeare Company, all of those early experiences that you had as an actor. How did mm. that kind of train you and teach you kind of your your steps as you progress through your career yeah it's a really good question you know systems change as you go along and um and education systems change and the school that i went to the drama center um was a very specific kind of school uh i I arrived there in uh 85 1985 Mm -hmm. and it was a very at the time it was considered to be a very um, maverick method school they taught method acting basically but the, you know this kind of wide range of methodologies um, the, the, the kind of main stay of it was a movement psychology training which was which was devised by one of the people who ran the school a guy called Yat Malmgren um, so it's it's kind of um, origins were European theatre Mm-hmm. You know, Stanislavski and Grotowski and Arto and those kinds of right. teachers and thinkers. So it was a very theatrical school. Uh, it was very methodological. And at the time that I was there, it was brilliant, brilliant school. But, you know, it didn't really serve you all that well for going into the profession as such. Mm-hmm. 
we didn't learn a lot about how to be an actor about you know how to kind of like do auditions how to you know um find agents all that kind of stuff but the the methodology i absolutely loved and it set me up for for life really because what they did teach at the drama center is how to work on your own you know very often you'll find yourself in a position especially doing films where you might do the initial read through and then you don't see anybody else until you're coming in and doing your scenes mm-hmm. and there's very little rehearsal there's very little analysis you know obviously if you're doing theater that you have a rehearsal time right but uh, but it taught me how to do all of that work on on my own you know mm-hmm. it taught me i have a very strong discipline in um, you know research and building character before i arrive at something Mm-hmm. No, yeah. I, I mean, I, I love that you talked about movement and kind of channeling that in your performance, because as we progress now into talking about the prequels, the, mm-hmm. the work that you had to do, especially under costume or under animatronic, really then carried through. And I, let's dive, I guess, into how you got connected with Robin Gerland, for instance, and let's say Rick McCallum. What was yeah. that first? Um, how did you get connected with that prequel team? And what was that first audition process like? Yeah, I, 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 I've told this story before. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, I've, said, I've told it so many times that it stops being embarrassing, but it's a fun <laughs> story. <clears throat> because um, I, 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 I grew up in this very sleepy town called Eastbourne in the south of England uh, in the 70s. And, um, and school was very busy for me. It was a good public school I was at. So I had lots of extracurricular activity. So going to the cinema was not something I did. There was one cinema in town. Uh-huh. And, uh, and it's just not something I did. Um, and so the Star Wars films completely passed me by. <laughs> I hadn't heard of them, but I never saw them. Right. And I didn't see them all the way up until adulthood. Uh-huh. In fact, until the day that I got a, <laughs> a phone call from my agent, who said, oh, you know, so I've got you an audition for Star Wars. And I went, what? That's, somebody's already used that title. And he right. went, no, 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 silence. They're making some, some new Star Wars films. And I went, who and why? <laughs> he said, oh my God, do you not know about this? I said, I don't even know about the originals. Right. And he's like, okay, look, so this is the deal. You go, you go and meet this person called Robin Gerland. She's attached to the director whose name is, is, is George Lucas. And I went, oh, thank you. I'd never heard of George. <laughs> this is so embarrassing. She goes, you go along and meet, uh, meet uh, this woman, Robin Gerland, and then they'll take it from there. And I went, okay. So um, I turn up to this hotel in Soho and, uh, and Robin has a camera set up in, in her, in her you know, suite. And I sit on the sofa and, and she starts the camera up and, and she said to me, so, um, so Star Wars, you've heard of Star Wars, obviously. And I just went, no. <laughs> and she thought I was joking. She thought I was, you know, pulling a bad prank. Hey. And she looked at me and she went, okay, let's not mess about, Silas. This is serious here. Now you, so you know all about it. And I went, no, Robin, I'm not messing about it. I don't know about Star Wars. You'll have to tell me. I know nothing about these films. Right. And she was like, really? And I told her, I said, yeah, I grew up. I didn't see them. And, you know, so tell me right. about them. So she kind of <laughs> scrabbled through the stories. Right. You know? and, and then um, she said to me, well, look, you know, um, we're kind of at the end of casting now. We have, a, we have a bunch of little roles, you know, that we're looking for people for. And your agent put you up for this and you sounded interesting. So we have this little pilot role. Right. Um, it turns out that that small role didn't actually make it to the screen. Um, but during this interview, because I had you know, said, oh, I, I know nothing about it. And then it was in the days when people were allowed to smoke indoors <laughs> and I'm not a smoker and Robin was smoking and she got out a cigarette. She was just about to light it. She goes, you don't mind if I smoke, do you? And I went, no, not at all. And she went, would you like one? I said, no, thanks. No, I don't smoke. And she went, oh, oh, sorry. And she put it back in the, in the box. And I went, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm not going to smoke in front of you. And I said, why not? She goes, no, 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 that, that'd be rude. And I went, that's very American of you. I said, you know, we don't care. <laughs> I said, we really don't care over here. You can smoke in front of me. And she was like, no. And I was like, please don't, don't just smoke, you know? <laughs> anyway, the interview just kind of carried on like that. So she had shown this interview to George mm-hmm. and, I, I have it on good authority that George liked the interview because he wasn't dealing with somebody who was like, oh my God, Star Wars, get me into right. the film. Right. You know. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so there was this little pilot role which never made it, but uh, she called back sometime later and she said, look, you know, things have switched around a bit. There's a couple of other things, but George does want to do um, some testing mm-hmm. 
for a couple of scenes, you know, when you're, when you're kind of, when you're putting a film together, often you need to just work out camera angles and, and uh, so on and so forth, and you need some, some bodies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went in there and uh, there were three of us, Mark Warren, myself and Jerome Blake. Mark Warren, right. uh, you know, very famous very, TV, yeah. TV uh, actor. And Jerome, of course, you know. Right. Uh, and the three of us kind of sat in this, uh, it was the, the, the Jar Jar Binks and um, Obi-Wan uh, and um, Luca in this um, pod that goes underneath the, the water. Right. And so uh, we, um, it wasn't Luke, sorry, Qui Gon, Qui Gon Jin. We, we played these characters and they did all the, fam you know, the, the kind of camera angles, they worked out all of that stuff. And Robin had said to me, like, if you come in and you kind of do this, you'll get to meet George and he's already seen your interview and, you know, we'll see what happens from there on in. So I went and did this day and we met, we had a right. good time together. And then she calls back about a week later and said, this other small role has come up for the pilot, which ended up being Lieutenant Williams. Couple of right. lines, right. you know. Would you like to do that? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to. You know, she said, it's a couple of days on set. I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. But then when I was on set and walking around with her, she and I by, by now had struck up something of a friendship. Uh -huh. You know, she'd seen me a few times, she was calling me, you know, and, uh, and she could see that I was willing to right. try things out. We went to the, um, we were looking around the model shop. She said, do you want to come and see the model shop after, after lunch? I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. So I went into this hallowed ground, you know, right. there's, a, there's a very particular smell when you go to these model shops right. of, of glue and prosthetic, uh -huh. foam, you know, and this, this, the, the air was thick with this smell. And I was looking around and I saw uh, the, the, the model, which would become the prototype for the head of Kiadi Mundi. Mm -hmm. I said to her, wow, this is, this is beautiful. I mean, what an extraordinary piece of, of modeling, you know, and a really amazing kind of um, face and an amazing character. And she went, oh, okay, that's really interesting. Like, how, how do you see him? And I said, well, he looks like this very, you know, wise kind of um, Native American spirit soul, you know, she goes, well, yeah, he's actually a Jedi master. And so we started chatting and then she looked at me and she went, have you ever done prosthetic work before? And I said, no, I haven't. She said, would you be interested in doing that? Because not a lot of people are, you know, she said people get very claustrophobic. And I went, well, I don't know. I mean, is there a way we can find out? She went, yeah, of course we do a prosthetic test on you. And, you know, and, and so it kind of, then she said, would you be interested in being inside one of these creatures? And I was very straight with her and I was like, yeah, I would because, you know, I've not done this kind of work and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm up for trying anything new. However, the characterization is really in the voice. So I'll do it if you allow me to do the voice. Oh, wow. And she said, she said no, 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 we don't, we don't do that. We, um, we get other actors to, to voice things. We get people to be inside them. And I was like, so break the rules, you know. <laughs> like I said to her, tomorrow I can bring you a demo tape of all of my voice stuff. Right. And, uh, and I said, if you listen to that, then we'll have a conversation. She went, okay. And it's, so it kind of like, you yeah. know, that was the long, long answer to a, a long process, actually. Right. They, these parts that I played kind of came out of me getting to meet Robin and then get to meet George and hanging around with them a bit, actually, yeah. as they were doing the pre-production. Yeah. That's that's so interesting because then, of course, the characterizations of especially Newt Gunray and Kaida Mundi really come into play because how did it change and evolve as then you put the costumes on and the animatronics and the prosthetics? How did you work on the walks and the gesturing and even the voice? How did that all come into play for you? Well, the thing about prosthetics is that you're very much... Um, you know, uh, you, you have all this stuff on you, which sort of blanks you out. The one thing that you have left before you go into the voice recording. I mean, I, I spoke on set, obviously, but they dub voices over. Right. Uh, the one thing you have left is your physicality, you know. So I thought very much about how to project a character through the body. Mm hmm. So, um, you know, with Kiadi, he's, I imagine him to be very uh, calm, very centered. You know, he's very relaxed, even when he's in battle. Mm -hmm. You know, he's so highly trained that he's a very calm voice. So I made him very, very still. 
you know, he sits in the council and he's very still and he's very relaxed. He's kind of sitting back cross-legged. You know, when he moves, he kind of almost glides, really. <coughs> that was my intention. And then with Newt, which is, you know, um, it was very heavy backpack right. on, on my back that contained all of the batteries and the, and the kind of the engines for the animatronics on, on the mask. And the mask is, is something that goes over the entire head. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very hard to see. It's very hard to hear. We had microphones, um, you know, on us and, and earphones in our ears to be able to, you know, hear what was going on around us and to be able to interact. But mm -hmm. all of that really closes down on you. So um, I used that backpack, which gave him a kind of um, hunched, Mm -hmm. shoulder look and I and I thought about the character thought he's this very you know slimy kind of um, ass kisser really right. you know of a viceroy and uh, and so I started to kind of develop the hands that you know constantly he's sort of holding on to himself and he's right. ingratiating himself all of the time right you know uh, or or constantly wagging his his finger at people and dismissing people and you know, so I developed all of those hand movements and, and the body and became a kind of a, a hunched character in an exaggerated way to be able to get through these big costumes and mm -hmm. all of the prosthetics and animatronics. So that was my initial approach. Right. You know, was to kind of physicalize them inside something which really covers you up. Yeah, a very interesting, because then how did it evolve for you at all then? Because I know that you recorded all the voice recording was really done at Abbey Road later on, yeah. which I'm sure, sure was I'm sure it was crazy in itself <laughs> recording there. Um, but how did your vocal performance then come into play and kind of using the history that you already had filming with those characters? Yeah, um, the thing with Kiadi is that uh, the voice is is recorded immediately on set mm. because um, the prosthetics just came around my mm -hmm. mouth here and then they painted my mouth. So, you know, it was easy for me to speak. There was no kind of sense of it being muffled or anything. Right. And very, very easy to hear through the foam, mm -hmm. the prosthetic foam. So, you know, that was much more kind of natural way of being. So, you know, I listened to, um, you know, Alec Guinness had this, Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful voices as Obi Wan, mm -hmm. and I thought about that kind of gentility, you know, that very English uh, voice, but also you know the voice of an old man, the voice of somebody who's very kind, mm -hmm. the voice of somebody who's extremely perceptive, doesn't have to project, doesn't have to shout a great deal, mm -hmm. but also somebody who's in power. I mean, if you think about um, Marlon Brando in The Godfather, let's say, right. there's a perfect example of somebody who has so much power, they don't have to shout. Mm -hmm. They don't have to project. Because whatever they say, people are going to listen. So I wanted to make his voice very soft and calm and, you know, slightly higher than mine. Mm -hmm. So it has this kind of otherworldly effect to it. You know, so that's how I spoke on the set. I didn't talk to George about it. I was just, I was going to jump in here and do it. Wow. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's how he came about. And then we did record the, the voices of, uh, the voice of Newt Gunray in post. Right. Um, because you couldn't hear anything on set in that garbled you know, helmet. And yeah, you mentioned that we recorded in Abbey Road. That was, that was immense for me. Yeah. I cannot imagine what it's like for uh, an English guy to go to Abbey Road and get right. to use the equipment there. It's you know, huge, huge. Yeah. And at the time that I went in, the, um, the Phantom Menace, we recorded in one go, all of the stuff in one go. So wow. you know, over the course of a day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, we had a lunch break. And down in the orchestra room, there's this enormous orchestra room where they can fit a full symphon symphonic orchestra. Right. Um, John Williams was recording that day. Wow. And George said to me on the lunch break, he said, would you like to go downstairs and have a look at, you know, yeah. John Williams and the orchestra recording? And I was like, would I? Yeah. No, it's okay. I don't need, yeah. <laughs> I would. I could yeah. afford my sandwich for that. Right. 
So that was immense going down there and seeing the orchestra playing and John Williams, you know, a huge, huge, huge. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, that voice was pretty much determined by what George wanted. I right. mean, he <clears throat> he talked um, about accents. He, he chose a Thai accent because there is something listening to Thai to Thai people speaking English um, that sounds almost as though their noses are blocked. It's a it's a placement of the voice, mm -hmm. and because the Nemoidians have no noses. Um, you know, he decided this would be quite a good accident, yeah. which has been very, very misinterpreted by people. Sure. Um, but uh, that was the simplicity of it. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, I thought about various different kind of, you know, actors and uh, their, their kind of tones, different voices, and came up with this, with this voice that is very um, obsequious, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of slimy with this tone of a of a um of a thai accent what i wanted to do was um go away from kiadi mundi so i really deepened his throat so he becomes like this you know mm -hmm. yes of course as you know a blockade is perfectly legal so that it was you know far away from my natural voice and far away right. from kiadi so that was how i kind of played around with right it. Mm. that's that's really interesting Especially because, I mean, Phantom Menace, you're playing four different characters in that movie, which is immense, you know, just and all four having action figures three years later. You know what I mean? It's, it's a very yeah. incredible feat to be able to differentiate. And I'm sure that was a challenge in itself, having to play four over the course of a certain amount of time. But then moving to Attack of the Clones and really being able to hone in on those two characters and yeah. Kaida Mooney, for instance, being able to fight and train, I'm sure was a whole additional element. Working with Nick Gillard, for instance, what was yeah. that like? Um, and what did you kind of add to the character as you progressed to then standing up and, and fighting and, and really? Yeah, yeah, um, it's a good question. And Nick is uh, really, I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant uh, fight coordinator and teacher. But he's also a really lovely man. And um, it's interesting that you kind of talk about the differentiation between the characters. What came into my mind straight away was, you know, that the answer that I gave you earlier about drama school. When you've been to a theatrical drama school, you know, the kind of stuff that we did was very uh, character driven. So it was less naturalistic in a filmic way, let's say, than people might be taught at drama school these days. It was very much kind of in the 80s, you know, with this kind of methodology, it was very character actor driven. So we played around a lot. We played around with makeup and we played around with physicality and we, you know, we played around yeah. with voices and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And there was very, there was free range for that. So um, that's the kind of training that I brought to differentiating these characters. Right. When I worked with Nick, what Nick is really good at is saying to somebody like, what are your strengths as a person? Mm -hmm. you know, have you fought before? What have you done? What is your body comfortable with? Right. So that you're not stretching yourself out of something that you're not, but you're containing yourself within something you can do. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, look, I've never done anything like this. Yeah. I haven't done any big fights. I don't know anything about martial arts or any of that kind of stuff. However, when I was at drama school, I did some stage fighting, you know, some sword fighting. And I've done two jobs on stage where I've had to use a sword. So I have some of those movements. Yeah. I said, but actually, and I play tennis a lot. Uh, and I said to him, I'm really, really bad at like double-handed shots. Uh -huh. you know, I've, got a, I've got a single handed backhand. And when you sword fight, you use only one hand. So I said, if we can do that, if we can actually have Kiadi fight with mostly with one hand, mm -hmm. that'd really help me out. And he went, great, nobody else is doing that. All the Jedi's fight with two hands. That's great, yeah. yeah. So, um, given the kind of the fake uh, sabers that that we used, I had to. There was a lot of strength in the wrist needed. Yeah. <laughs> but it but it it means that he stands aside a little bit because he does most of his fighting with one hand. You know, which right. is kind, of, kind of unusual. So we just brought a lot of the movements um, that that kind of I knew of into play. Right. You know, and and of course he taught me stuff and and put stuff on top of that. But a lot of the time, Nick just gives you free reign. You know, mm -hmm. he's just like, 
do do what feels right to you and we'll play around with that mm -hmm. i really i really no i because I, again you, you talking about nick gillard in that way is so reaffirming because i was able to speak with him probably a year and a half ago and it, it's he's such a monumental part of these movies especially yeah. the prequels differentiating we keep using that word but from the original trilogy especially and making it a lot more physical and a lot uh, more refined at the same time. And I think Coyote is a great example of kind of bringing that, that balance of what we were used to in the original trilogy and then the, the modern sword fighting that really happened in the yes. prequels. So. Yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah, he, and and um, yeah, he's just, he's very free like that. Yeah. You know, he's a very free operator. Yeah. Uh, uh, sharing on screen with both of your roles, especially in Attack of the Clones, went from uh, Frank Oz especially sticks out to me in Phantom Menace and being able to work alongside him, I'm sure it was incredible. But then you have Christopher Lee and Tamir Morrison and Jimmy Smits and being mm -hmm. able to work alongside these actors. I'd be curious, because you mentioned especially like Newt Gunray not being able to see or react. How was it working with these actors and working with any of your co-stars? And then do you have any specific memories of, of some of them while you were on set mm -hmm. during these movies? Yeah, I, 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 you know, um, it was incredible, actually. I mean, now that you reel off the names, you know, it, <laughs> yeah, crazy. It, it, it does remind me of, you know, when I first started doing this, mm -hmm. you know, I would sometimes look around the room and go, wow, you know, there's Sam Jackson, there's Liam Neeson, and there's Ewan McGregor, and there's George Lucas, and there's Frank Oz, and, you know. Right all these people you kind of you have to kind of pinch yourself sometimes right. you know but the thing about uh doing any job is that when we get onto the set we are no longer those famous people right we're, we're a bunch of artists trying to tell a story and by and large i would say 99 percent of the time that's how people approach it. You, mm -hmm. Once you get onto a set, you, you don't have people, you know, behaving as though they own the place or that they're better right. than you. You know, by and large, actors are really good. They understand that we're just a group of people who are trying to put a story together. So it's a great leveler. Yeah. You know, suddenly you're all talking together and you're kind of mixing together. And it's really about, you know, getting to know each other as people because you're, you're working together on the same level. Right. And I really found that with... Um, with Star Wars, you know. Um, and they're all, you know, just really lovely people. It was slightly different when I was at, when we did Phantom Menace, because we filmed here in London, mm -hmm. just outside of London, Leavesden. So in that kind of setting, I'm going back and forth to my home. Mm -hmm. um, and of course the prosthetics for Chiari were very, very long. Right. process so you know i i would be on set with people and then you know i'd be going home the second two films of course we filmed in australia right. so many of us were traveling from other places and then we were all holed up together in a hotel mm -hmm. which is very different because you're all going back to the same home right so then you see you see people out of costume and out of prosthetics in the bar in the restaurants you know hanging out with each other so you get to know each other a little bit more and you've got more downtime in the studio together because, you know, you're not going to rush off back home. You're going to hang mm -hmm. out and, and maybe share a car with somebody back to the hotel, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we got to know each other much more. And once you do three films together, you become something of a family. Right. You know? So all of those are great levelers, you know, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Christopher Lee, I mean, just incredible to work alongside him one of the things i found out about christopher lee which i'm sure lots of people know but i didn't know at the time was that he was an opera singer uh -huh. he had trained not as an opera singer and um and he had this incredible voice and he wanted to become an opera singer but ended up you know going into movies and, right. and become the most prolific movie maker i think right. he i think he still holds the record for most yeah. of the movies uh -huh. you know made by any actor incredible but uh, when he told me this i was like wow i had mm -hmm. no idea and he thought oh Silas and he told me about his love of opera you know uh -huh. and I said go on then sing me something and he, did. <laughs> wow. he did he just suddenly burst into song on That's set great. I love it. and I was like whoa this extraordinary bass voice just uh -huh. came booming out you know that's incredible yeah 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 I had no idea I'm sure lots of people you know um, would have known that but I didn't 
you no, and you got to hear it for yourself too. I know. I didn't know about the opera. I know he has a head metal record. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but he has like a death metal where he is singing, and it's out there. You can find it. It's very cool. <laughs> I, I really, have heard that. Yeah, have, it's yeah, it's very yeah. cool. Yeah, he was an extraordinary man. Yeah, yeah, very and but very a, a real gentleman, very kind, mm -hmm. and he loved the fact that I was as tall as him. <laughs> you know, both very very tall characters and yeah. he loved that. That's great. I'm I'm glad that you brought up the family dynamic, especially because you were in all three and yeah. kind of leading now into Revenge of the Sith and both of your characters having death scenes and and really adding to the gravity of that final, let's say, 30 minutes of the movie. Um, not only with the death of the characters, but the ending of shooting, I'd love to kind of just end the talk about Star Wars, especially with kind of maybe delving in a little bit more into that dynamic and what you kind of grew and learned throughout the I mean that's a almost a full decade of of shooting these movies mm. um and that process that you kind of went through with probably the same cast and crew over and over again mm. um each each shooting period mm. what did I learn from that experience um well I think actually I learned I learned a lot of a lot about humility mm -hmm. from from George and from the other people who were there um, but George especially, I mean, he kind of, you know, he's a very kind and immediate person, George. You know, if you're standing next to him behind a monitor, he will strike up a conversation with you. He's not somebody who, uh, you know, I mean, given his position mm -hmm. in this world, you could, you know, he could be forgiven for being very, very arrogant or, or perhaps looking down his nose at people, but he doesn't. He's absolutely, he's one of the most down to earth, incredibly famous people I know. Right. You know, and he engenders that kind of um, atmosphere on set. You know, he, he brought us all together at the very beginning. The, the very first time that we all met up, I was, we did the read through. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew a couple of people there. I knew Ian McDermott and Oliver Ford Davis from mm -hmm. the kind of theatre circuit. But otherwise, you know, the people that I was with in the room were, um, you know, were unknown to me as people, but known to me as great luminaries. Mm -hmm. And yet we just sat around this table having a cup of coffee and reading the script and chatting. And it was so genial. Yeah. You know, um, and that was the tone that, that, um, that George set for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I watched him a lot, actually. I watched the way in which he, he interacted with people. And it's quite remarkable to see somebody who is that innovative, mm -hmm. you know, and that creative, who has brought something extraordinary and massive to the world, right. still working with great humility, still asking you, what do you think? How would you like to play this? Do you have any ideas? You know, I wrote the scene in a bit of a rush. Do you think it makes sense? What would you like to bring to it? Wow, yeah. You know, so I learned a lot from his humility. And I learned a lot from um, the, the atmosphere that he created. Um, I always try and work in that way. I always, yeah. you know, everybody on set is important. Every single person is a member of the team that makes the whole thing work. Mm -hmm. That's everybody. That's the runners the people who come in and clean the dressing rooms before you come in in the morning, the makeup artists, the, the, the stars, the directors, the producers, you know, the, um, the model makers, everybody is a part of this whole thing. And nobody is bigger or better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I always try and carry that with me when I work. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, that was a, it was an early lesson for me of course, there's a lot of that kind of feeling in theatre. But when you go onto a film set with people who are that big, right. that famous, that well-known, that well-established, and have that much power right. in the film industry, to see that atmosphere on a set like that, you know, that was the greatest lesson for me. That's really, that's really incredible. And, I mean, we've talked a lot about Star Wars, and I, I would be remiss, you've had such an incredible career since... And there are two that stick out to me, just not to take too much more of your time. Um, but first, uh, Doctor Who and the Ood, I think, is such, again, like, you're just doing all these iconic roles. And, like, um, I would love to talk just a little bit about stepping into another science fiction franchise, delivering an iconic performance. Um, did Was there a difference with Star Wars and with Doctor Who? Or what, what did you kind of take and, and give between those two experiences? Yes, there was a big difference, actually, because I just do the voice of the Ood. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so I haven't actually ever got to go on set of, you know. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's always just, you know, uh, post-recorded uh -huh. and recorded in a studio. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting when it came up because it came on the back of Star Wars. Right. So, you know, I have, uh, I have a voice reel now that includes obviously those voices. <laughs> right. Um, you know, whatever my agent, you know, puts out to, to people to do, you know, animation voices or video games. That's one of the first things that they'll that they say, you know, yeah. he's done all these voices on Star Wars. Right. People go, right, okay, got it, you know. <laughs> so I just got a phone call one yeah. day, evening, and it was for one episode to go and do um, the Ood, and there were a couple of other alien voices. And they went, well, we know, we know that you can play around with voices, and you like doing right. silly voices, you know, we, know, we know who you are, and we've got the tape, and so on and so forth. You know, would you like to do this character? And then they showed me, you know, they showed me pictures of the Ood, and I was like, wow, how am I going to voice that, you know? <laughs> right. So we just... Um, we just kind of played around, you know, mm -hmm. with stuff and, and, uh, and we landed on this voice and they went, great, let's, let's do that. And then of course the character continued. Right. You know, so they just kept calling me back. Yeah. And, uh, and I do a whole bunch of ouds and they just throw different effects on them. And sometimes <laughs> I, I'll play around with the, you know, the scale of, of, of my voice, but um, they just keep com com coming back. I yeah. just keep doing them, you know, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still, I still yeah. have these recordings um, for Big Finish, which is a production right. here that does. Yeah, you know them. Yeah, the audio dramas, yeah. Yeah, the audio dramas. I still do those, and I still turn up every once in a while and do some ouds and, you know. That's great. But the funny thing is, I never, because it's always just done in a studio, mm -hmm. I'm not inside the oud, so I've never right. been on set. I've never met David Tennant mm, until recently. Oh. <laughs> we, um, he, uh, plays a character in a TV um, a miniseries. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy was a serial killer mm -hmm. in England, in London, um, Dennis Nilsson in the 70s and 80s. And uh, they've just made this miniseries. Uh, brilliant, brilliant piece of writing. And David plays wow. Dennis Nilsson. Mm -hmm. And I played uh, one of the investigating, senior investigating officers. Uh -huh. So when we had the read through for this, which was only at the end of 2019, it was uh -huh. like towards the end of the year, um, beginning of this year, the first thing uh, at, at the read through, David came straight up and went silent. <laughs> he said, we've worked together, but we haven't. Because <laughs> we've done so many scenes together, but we've right. never been in the same room doing the scenes. Yeah. You know? And then about two or three uh, weeks after that, I went to the Comic Con um, convention in Wales, and David mm -hmm. happened to, happened to be there, and he came up to me in the canteen. He was like, "Well, we got to stop meeting like this." You know? <laughs> That's so uh, I finally got to meet him. Although I have worked with his wife on on the uh, on the on the Doctor Who um, series, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the the stories. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that was That's great. Yeah, it was lovely doing those voices, and I still do them. They're still yeah. there. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, the The final part of your filmography I want to talk about, just because it's such a personal favorite of mine, is working with Paul Thomas Anderson ah. for Phantom Thread. Uh, what an incredible film! Uh, I'd love to just talk a little bit about working with that director and that experience. And and yeah, he's incredible, PTA, isn't he? I mean, it was a, it was a huge, you know, it's a huge privilege for me um, just to 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 do that. I mean, his. His casting director and, and, and kind of PA, um, Cassandra Calacandas, she, I got a phone call from her. This is, a, this is one of those extraordinary stories, happenstances really, mm -hmm. that happens in our careers every once in a while. Years ago, I did, um, I did Macbeth at the Almeida Theatre in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, there was a young actor in it called Tom Mackay, um, who's just brilliant, brilliant actor. He had been um, auditioning for, um, for the role of the doctor mm -hmm. in Phantom Thread, and he got very close to it. And in the end, they went with one of the Gleason boys. Um, but he had gotten to know um, Cassandra really quite well during that time, because I think he went back and auditioned four or five times. Because mm -hmm. Paul likes to um, improvise with people a lot. So you'll mm -hmm. even be improvising in 
in auditions. <coughs> and Tom had gone back a number of times. I just happened to go to the Almeida Theatre uh, to watch a brilliant play uh, that Juliet Stevenson was in. And they had the audience kind of in the round. So I was sitting at this side of the stage, away from the auditorium. I had no idea that night that Tom Akai, who I hadn't seen for about 12 years, happened to be in the audience. But he saw me because uh -huh. I was up because I was near to the stage. You know? And he was like, Silas, I haven't seen him in years. You know? <laughs> The very next day, he goes in for his final meeting with Cassandra, and they're chatting away. And Cassandra said, "Oh, we've got this, we've got this part. It's not a very big part, but it's a very specific part because it's 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 actually um, it, we're not using his real name, but it is actually right. based on a real character. Right. And this guy has to be South American, you know, and um, and he has to be incredibly kind of suave and have this presence to him." And we've been looking, we haven't found anybody. And Tom goes, well, this is really weird. He said, <laughs> I saw this guy in the theater last night. Uh, and, and he's got a mercurial kind of look to him, but he could very, very definitely be Spanish-American. Um, you, should, you should look him up. His name is Silas Carson. So I get this phone call right. directly from Cassandra. And she tells me the story and I'm like, is this, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, have you not gone through my agent? And she went, yeah, I just, I wanted to come through to you first. I got your number from Tom. I hope that's okay. And I was like, yeah, but is this real? And she went, yeah, 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 it is real. Don't worry. I'll go through your agent. To, you make it official. But if, you're, if you've got time to pop in this week, do come and see us. And I was like, great, you know, I'd love to. So they had this scene and basically I just improvised a lot around it. Paul was busy. They were already filming. Right. Uh, so I went and spent the day with Cassandra. She's a really lovely woman. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, she was so entertaining, really relaxed. And um, and so you know, I um, I went there and I, I had done some work on the accent. It's a very very mm -hmm. specific accent, and um, Dominican Republican mm -hmm. accent. And uh, I did a lot of work on that. And I went there, and she said, you know, she said, okay, listen. Um, you have to, you know, you have to maintain this accent the whole time. So even when we're talking, we're chatting, maintain the accent because, you know, Paul doesn't really like people to put things on. He wants the original deal, you know. And I was like, okay. So I did this accent throughout the whole interview and then, you know, we improvised and stuff. The next day I got a call. She said, Paul loved your tape. You know, he would love you to come and do this, but you got to keep the accent on set. You know, and I was like, okay. Don't let him hear that you're English. And I was like, uh, okay. You know, because you, you hear a lot of stories about right. him. Everybody's got to be in character all of the time, you know. Right. But Brandon, you've listened to me now for, you know, the whole of this interview. You know that I'm a very straight up guy. And, uh, you know, I can play games, but only to a degree, you know. Right. So of course, I go along on set and I keep the accent up the whole time, hmm. you know. And, uh, and then when we went to the, uh, to the premiere in mm -hmm. London, um, I bump into Paul on the stairs. Uh -huh. Of course, I'm not going to do the accent. Of course, I'm chatting in my own voice to him. And, uh, and he's chatting away to me, and, and I'm talking in my English voice, you know, about 20 minutes or something. And uh, by that time, he, the, the film had been nominated, you know, for, for a few Oscars, I think it was. And I said to him, you know, and he was going off on the, the next week, I think, to the Oscars. I was like, good luck with the Oscars, mate. I really, I really hope you get that. And he went, oh, thanks, Silas. And it's been lovely working with you. I went, oh, I suddenly went, oh, oh, I haven't, I haven't been doing the accent. And he went, oh, no, no, that's all nonsense. He said, I totally knew you're English. <laughs> I totally knew that. He said, people think this thing about me where they want me to, you know, be, be a particular thing. I'm not at all. Yeah. He said, fine, you know. <laughs> I knew you're English. But he said, you did a good job of it. You know. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. it. He's such an inventive man. Yeah. I mean, you know. The thing about him is he's kind of, you know, he's making stuff up as he goes along. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got lots and lots of different options. But even when he's behind the camera, he's trying out different things. He's going, let's change this. Let's move this around a bit. Let's, and he's kind of, he's kind of on the hoof. You know, obviously he knows what he's doing. Obviously he's got a whole body of options that he can choose from. Mm -hmm. But that's where the improvisation comes in. That's where the playing comes in. He plays mm -hmm. the stuff all the time because... Some people come into a set and they know exactly what they want. They've storyboarded it and they're going, right, this is where we're going. With Paul, he's got all of these different options and he's like, I'm not sure where we're going today. Let's, let's play around. You know? Yeah. 
So even with something like that, I was just on set for a couple of days. Um, right. There was a lot of playing, a lot of improvisation. He's a genius. I think he's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. and I love, I love that idea of the improvising because it really does then come across in the movies and each one is so different and so unique from each other that if yeah. you look at but they're all so uniquely him so um but anyway yeah. phantom thread one of my favorite movies of the decade really so i'm so glad that you pop yeah. in oh that's great <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and i like yeah. the fact that i'm in phantom thread and the phantom menace <laughs> right there you go a nice a nice bookend right yeah. there yeah but, um, he, he's uh that film is so beguiling it's mm -hmm. so beguiling. You don't quite know what it's going to be when it starts and it ends up being something quite different. Right. And it kind of just draws you in. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Really incredible. Well, uh, to end, we talked a little bit about the, the new David Tennant series. Is there anything else, any upcoming projects that you're excited about or that fans can watch you in um, coming out soon? I know that <laughs> things are crazy in terms of releases. But. Well, yes, things are crazy at the moment. I mean, at the moment, there's, there's, there's nothing on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing, one of the parts of our industry that has opened up here is, um, is the voiceover mm -hmm. work. So I've done a few video games recently, um, but I am bound by confidentiality contract mm, not to be able to, you know, to talk about yeah. that. But sadly, our industry is closed down for now. Yeah. Um, you know, there are some productions that are, you know, waiting to go, mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, there's still, all the unions are still trying to figure out how do we do this safely. Right. So I know that in America, there are a couple of productions happening. And over here, there are two television productions, one of them being EastEnders, the other one, I'm not quite sure what it is. And they're, they're working out how they can, you know, kind of have people working in a safe in right. environment, which you, know, you can yeah. imagine the, the logistics of that. So until those things take off, our industry is still, you know, is, is still asleep. Yeah. Really. So no projects in in the you know in the pipeline yet i do have that uh there's a couple of tv programs coming out mm -hmm. you know the um the one about dennis nelson which has as yet is still untitled but there's been a lot of reportage on it so you can find out about that and um and there's another tv program that'll be coming out over here but it won't be shown in the states but otherwise we're just waiting for things to to open up I'm doing, um, I'm doing a fair bit of voiceover work at the moment and I'm getting into doing audio books. So I've created uh -huh. my home studio and I'm starting to record uh, audio books. So at the moment, we're just kind of waiting to see what yeah. happens. I hope that things, you know, um, open up soon. It's been yeah. a tough year for everybody. Yeah, it really yeah. has. Yeah, well, I hope so as well. And again, thank you for coming on. And this is such a huge honor and stay safe. And, thank you very uh, but much. Thank, you, thank you. Yeah, thank One you very, very much. I do think about under these circumstances, which is a great shame, is, is the conventions. People yeah. are unable to gather at the moment in, en masse. And, uh, and, you know, there'll be a lot of Star Wars fans out there listening to this who go to those conventions. And I just want to say to them that I'm sorry for what you're going through. We will meet at some point. <laughs> yeah. It will happen again. However, yeah. We there'll be a way, but, uh, but I, I, I miss seeing everybody and I miss meeting, yeah. you know, fans and audience. So I hope that side of it picks up soon as well. Yeah, I hope so too. And I hope one day that your path comes back to Dallas and uh, we can meet yeah. in person. Uh, but I have very happy memories of Dallas. I was overwhelmed by Dallas. I think. Really? <laughs> yeah. Everything in America compared to England is massive. Right. You know, the roads are really wide and the buildings are really tall and the spaces are huge. And you know, so I, when I first arrived at Dallas, I was just like a, in a candy shop walking around going, wow, look at this. You know? <laughs> for better or for worse, yes, everything in Texas is bigger. Right? Everything is bigger in Texas is the official. But people in Texas, I just found Texans to be really, really uh, genuinely open and kind, friendly, very friendly people. It's good to hear. Well, again, thank you very much for coming on. What a thank pleasure to right. talk to you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you again to Mr. Carson for his time, his stories, and his incredible charm. What a fantastic interview, and as I said over and over again, a huge honor. August continues, and I am still giving away a ton of my personal rare signed stuff online, so head to our Twitter and Instagram accounts to see how you can win by just leaving a five-star review this month for the show. 
Next week, we're talking to production designer of The Rise of Skywalker, the legendary Kev Jenkins. And this Thursday, there might be a small merch announcement. So until then, stay tuned, leave a five-star review, and may the Force be with you.